It's time to talk IT, information technology. Sounds intimidating, it's actually fascinating because we've convened an IT roundtable to talk about a variety of great IT topics. I want to welcome John Burgess, he's the CEO of Mainstream Technologies, Christy Crum, Regional President of Verizon Wireless, and Lee Watson, President of the Venture Center. Thank you all for being here, appreciate you. Yeah, well, thank welcome. you for having us. All right, I want to start with the Internet of Things. I teased in the break right before here that if you didn't know what that meant, you should definitely stick around. If you know what it means, you should stick around too because you'll want to hear what you have to say. Who wants to give me the best definition of what the Internet of Things is? I'll jump out there. Do it. The Internet of Things is the next logical extension of, of getting the technology into just embedded in your everyday life. You used to have to go to a, a machine to work with technology. Then we put the technology in, in your hand. And now the next wave is that the, the technology is ubiquitous in everything you do. It's in your watch, it's in your car, it's in your toaster. It's uh, literally there is no end, no limit to where the technology is going to be embedded now. That's pretty good. Now who's wearing an, a, a thing that has the internet embedded on it? Oh yes, yes of course. Yes. We can count on you guys for and gadgets. And that's an interesting point right there. So if you look at where we've come from, so back in 2010, there was basically one connection per every person on the planet. In 2015, right now, there are 25 billion connected devices out there, mm -hmm. which three times more than the human population on the planet. And by 2020, there will be over 50 billion connected devices. Which is almost double, it's about 6.58. It looks like you've been reading my notes, Christy, because I actually pulled <laughs> that exact same, those statistics before we... Well, it's hard to, you know, how does that happen? Well, that happens right now, you're already seeing it, right? So your thermostats, now can be connected wirelessly your you know everything in your home can be your mm -hmm. house is pretty soon we're going to have smart cities and it's going to go on and on and on where everything we have is connected. So it's not an irreversible trend it is a growing trend that there really is no end in sight it integrates into our everyday lives is yeah. this is good for business. Yeah in, you know think about it as the third wave so you had the computer revolution then there was the internet and this is really what's next. And it'll be that disruptive or more disruptive than what the internet's been. It's good for companies like mainstream technologies? Absolutely. Tell me how. Any, any uh, software that was written for one of these first or second wave uh, devices, that software needs to be rewritten to, to work on a different device or to work on different devices. And the, the, the ideas for how you can take a, a device and put it on the internet, um, the ideas are just endless in terms of create creative, innovative ideas for how to how to use this device in a in a smart, interactive way. And Christy, obviously, it's good for consumer and consumer sales. If you're in a company like Verizon Wireless, just what do you see in your retail stores in terms of the the potential products that John's talking about in terms of innovation? That's right. So I want you to think about running your air conditioner, being able to manage that from your smartphone, being able to open your garage door from your smartphone, being able to unlock your do doors with your smartphone, being able to track the number of hours of sleep you get, track how many steps you take. For businesses, it's a game changer for businesses. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely think about the automobile industry where people made those cars by hand. Well, now they're going to be made by machines connected and all those machines are going to be powered by connect connections. So we're going to go in the U.S. to 50 trillion gigabytes of data in 2020. So think about all those connections, 50 billion connections, 25 million apps, and just lots of data flowing, connecting together to make everything that we do smarter, more efficient, more productive, better. I can't count to the trillions. That's way <laughs> over my pay grade. I go billions, but when we get to trillions, I can't do it. All right, so Christy says game changer for business. Tell me how that impacts entrepreneurship. Yeah, so it opens up a whole new world of opportunity. You know, the healthcare space is another mm -hmm. space that's going to be affected. And it's, it's not just a fitness tracker, but it's other biological data, right? So if, imagine if you have uh, diabetes and instead of you know one prick test a day or whatever just that constant monitoring mm -hmm. of, of what's going on inside your body sitting you know you having that data sending that data to the healthcare providers the doctors to you know diagnose and treat way more efficiently than what they can do today mm -hmm. And it's a, and what's the danger side of all of this though? I mean, too much information can be dangerous. Too much monitoring can be dangerous. We talk about the security aspects, the privacy aspects of all of this. 
should we feel threatened? There's, I mean, you read the paper every day. There's there's the hack of the week or the the, the breach of the week. Uh, there's certainly uh, certainly risk there, but um, I think the the IoT wave is coming at the right point with our information security awareness. So I think the professionals in in the industry have kind of finally gotten their heads around, yes, we need to, anything we do, we need to think security first as we roll these kinds of new ideas out and the, the underlying protocols and, and how these devices all talk to each other is kind of starting to be developed from the ground up with, with security as a, as a key focus. All right, we got to take a quick commercial break. We're going to talk some more about some of these subjects, so you guys will stick around, all right? All right, we're back right after this word from our sponsors. I'm Roby Brock. This is Talk Business and Politics. And welcome back to Talk Business and Politics. I am with Mainstream Technologies, John Burgess, Verizon Wireless, Christy Crum, and Lee Watson from the Venture Center. All right, we're talking about just uh, how much security and privacy is at stake with all this technological development advancement that's going on. Um, I kind of want to get all of your perspectives on how you convince someone to transition from the old to the new. I think there's a lot of different ways and different lenses you guys might look through this. And Christy, I'll come to you first with that. How do you convince a consumer or a business owner that it's time to upgrade? Mm -hmm. It can be overwhelming. Well, we do that a lot, right? We meet with businesses. And I think it's really important from a business perspective to have a technology partner that you trust that can teach you. Here is all of the technology in your business, not just in Arkansas, but across the country. We sit down with businesses every day and we show them, here is what's coming. You've, you cannot miss a market transition. At some point, there is a cost to not upgrading your technology, mm -hmm. right? So you have to weigh, what is it today that I'm being asked to spend, and at what point do I get more value out of that than holding on to this older technology? And if you're a new business, I would say absolutely make sure that you future-proof your business from the very beginning. Get all of the latest technologies, have a partner that understands that, and understand what all your competitors are coming to the table with. The days of not having backup, wireless backup, so your POS system's going out, why would you have that happen? There's a cost to that every minute. Why would you have paper? Why would you, I mean, there's so many th questions that I ask absolutely. that at some point the cost of that technology will absolutely, you know, be worth it in terms of productivity, efficiencies, et cetera. Lee, your take. Yeah, I think you gotta know when the opportunity is there, and you gotta really watch for that. You know, some of the best startup, you know, examples that we see in the newspapers all the time are companies that, you know, knew when to build something on top of a new platform that was getting traction. Uh, you know, Facebook, right? Not the first social network, but knew what the market was doing, leveraged new technologies, uh, and they're the player today. And nobody remembers, you know, the other right. social network <laughs> sites that were, you know, there Somebody before. Nobody remembers who was the other social network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. Showing your age, there. Yeah. John. What do you you deal with a lot of customers in legacy systems mm -hmm. that um, I mean, maybe 10, 15, 20 years old? Are they that old, or are they younger? There are that? there are plenty of pieces of software running out there that are you know, as old as I am. <laughs> um, what we, you know, what we tell our customers is that no matter what your uh, SIC code says that your business is, you are in the technology business. Uh, and these different waves of, of technology introduce new opportunities, but they also raise the bars for what the minimum expectation is. So if, if you're, you know, the, the internet age, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, the, 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 the bubble to go out and get your flashy website, well now with you know, PDAs, smartphones, that is passe. So, you know, that's a, that's a modernization requirement if you're going to stay competitive in the, in, the, in the marketplace. I think the trick, too, is really to know when and where to make those changes right. and to have partners that can help you, you know, mm -hmm. walk through. So I've got the Apple iWatch, and so I can go and pay, right, using my Amex with the Apple Pay Watch. Everything that happens behind the scenes is still running on mainframe software from the 1970s. So some of it just still works. So you really have to know when and where, and, you and, know. And those drivers are more, you know, we, we call those the system of engagement, which is on your wrist, versus the system of record, which is where all the, all the ledgers are balanced. Right. Um, those opportunities are driven, or those changes are driven more by the, the hardware and the infrastructure and the bandwidth, broadband advances in, 
in the heavy lifting layer mm -hmm. so that some of that software is fine running on the 30-year-old the COBOL system, but the cost of ownership as new, as new server hardware, new faster networking gear comes out, that presents opportunities to save money by modernizing that platform. Christy, I talked to a telecom exec one time, I remember this very vividly, and this was probably 10 years ago, who said you need to make the investment when it is going to give you a quantum leap in productivity. Yes. You know, if it's just a tiny incremental thing, it might not be the right time to do it. Is that good advice to follow? I, absolutely, I think that's great advice to follow. So think about this, in the next five years, millennials are gonna, now the word millennials, I know I brought it to the table, I said it, 60% of the purchasing power. They want things now, they want things at this minute, they want technology, they were born into technology, they don't wanna wait. So mm -hmm. they absolutely be thinking about that right now, in the next five years, that those are who I'm going to be doing business with, those millennials that want things now. What does my technology look like right now, and where do I need to be in the next five years to get to that customer satisfaction rate? Yeah, batch processing is so last year. That's mm -hmm. right. right. Yes. All right, does anybody know what a yucky is real quick? A yucky, it's a new term I read about this week, Y-U-C-C-I-E. It's a young urban creative. It's one of those millennials that are living in the downtown area. We're that all still trying to figure out millennials. <laughs> Don't right. worry, somebody else. All right, we got to wrap it up here. I want to uh, talk a little bit more about STEM and STEAM education. Will you guys stick around for a web extra? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, John Burgess, Christy Crum, Lee Watson, thank you very much for being here. And welcome back to our Web Extra. We're talking about information technology with our IT roundtable today. We have Mainstream Technologies' John Burgess. We have Verizon Wireless' Christy Crum. And we have the Venture Center's Lee Watson. All right, so we were talking about a lot of things on air. Now we're off air. Let's talk about STEM education, STEAM education. Do we need to eliminate the words, first of all, that stands for STEM and STEAM stand for what, Lee? So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, good, you get an right? A plus. And so STEAM, the A is arts. Yes. And the new term is E-STEAM. So e the E being entrepreneurship. Oh, okay. All right, I got yeah. that. So do we need to just get rid of STEM and STEAM altogether and just call it E-STEAM from here on out? Should we? I'm well, letting you guys make the executive decision we, on this. You get to set the trend. You know, whatever we call it, we simply need more students graduating <laughs> yes. with these skills because there's not enough today. There won't be enough five years from now and 10 years, it's really scary if we don't start making some change. So Governor Asa Hutchinson's passed a computer coding initiative, which I would argue is a good first step in that direction, yes. but it's not the only step that we should be taking in that direction, Christy. No, I mean, listen, you're gonna have an uh, explosion of devices, we talked about that, 50 billion connected devices, 50 trillion gigabytes of data. There's got to be teams of people who are making that happen. All 80% of the jobs in the very near future will be technology related, which means that we will not have a workforce equipped to handle that mm -hmm. in the near future. The other thing that that uh, initiative doesn't cover is, you know, women in the tech segment. So right now, 60%, over 60% of girls in the fourth grade are interested in science, technology, engineering, and math when they're in the fourth grade. By the time they make it to college, only 18% of yes. them actually pursue those careers. And so we've got a larger initiative, whether or not that, you know, requires, uh, you know, uh, you know, the governor to get involved. I do believe it requires community leaders to get involved as well. That's something that we've got to solve for if we want to make sure that we're ready for the next generation, because it's happening, it's going to happen, and there's nothing we can do about that. We just need to make sure we prepare our kids to be able to compete in that space. And I wouldn't have invited the three of you here if I didn't think y'all had strong opinions on that. John, you, you your company makes investments in yes. this e-steam uh, yes, activity. Very strongly in it as an economic game changer uh, for for people to, to raise their standard of living. Uh, it's a good time to be a programmer, as you said. I mean, the highest, you know, always in the top three in terms of highest starting salaries, highest career potential. Uh, regard to women, uh, that's a. I mean, I've seen those same numbers about where we lose the girls in middle school and high school, uh, despite the fact that. Software development or a computer science degree, uh, career is the most egalitarian from a compensation standpoint mm -hmm. across male and female. So the, the, the opportunities are, are wide open for, for women and we're, we're not getting the message out effectively. So what else should we be doing besides, I mean, the computer coding initiative is just getting all the limelight right now, but I mean, you got the iron yard coming in, you got Girls of Code, you got a bunch of mm -hmm. kind of nonprofit and um, private sector type of stuff happening, but how do we, build more, advance more? How do, we, how do we get much more momentum moving faster in this direction? 
Well, I do think making sure that uh, the private sector understands and the public sector understands the challenge here. You know, at Verizon, we gave over $19 million last year to STEM education because we see it as the next game changer and we need to have uh, boys and girls ready to step up into these fields. But some of it is giving grants. Some of it's in the form of sponsorships of Girls Who Code or other forms of mm -hmm. other organizations. We've got to make sure that first everyone understands this isn't a buzzword. This isn't the flavor of the week. This is where the world is going and we need to prepare our children for it. Yeah. What are you saying, Lee? So there are a lot of organizations in Arkansas focused uh, in this space. And so Noble Impact is a new startup focused on entrepreneurship and service in K through 12. You have the Ozark STEM Coalition and the Arkansas STEM Coalition. Uh, looking at the entire pipeline and figuring out where those gaps are, building programs, getting sponsorship or grants to, you know, to, to create a uh, complete pipeline of talent so development. Where are the gaps right now? Where do you think we're losing them? So I think you know, six months ago we would have said it's teaching kids how to code, mm -hmm. uh, but now we have the Innovation Hub in North Little Rock, and that's one of their pieces, mm -hmm. right? So taking K through 12 students, mixing in the arts and coding and engineering and uh, three, you know, printing things on a 3D printer. So that, that's, a, that's a really cool thing uh, and, and a big piece of that pipeline. Uh, there's several others. Museum, I think, but that Muse Museum of Discovery does a great yeah, job. Yeah, but of that doesn't reach all of what we're talking about, of what we're missing here. I mean, this No, but it's a good model a, okay. to start with, right? And then you get more of the business community and the, and the public sector involved, take those models, expand the models around the rest of the state. And now you've got, you know, you've got great examples of stuff that, that works that needs to be replicated. That's a, the word I was going to use. We need replication is well, what you're and saying. I think, I think societally we have, you know, we've, we've kind of changed this thought process that I need to go to college. Everybody understands that they need to go to college now. But I think the, the STEM disciplines are, are historically viewed as more difficult. They're more rigorous. Mm -hmm. um, you can spend more time studying, more time with your nose in the book. Um, and I think as a result, the, generally, the attractiveness of those, of those disciplines in college has waned. You know, we're producing more liberal arts, more, more soft science um, graduates. So I think there's, you know, we need to just up and down the chain, change the, the attractiveness and the, and the perception of, mm -hmm. you know, it might be, might be a little harder to get the degree, but the rewards are, are there if you stay with it. So that's a big piece and, and something I think this new computer science task force does is it shows what computer science really is in the, in the high school arena. When a student goes to college and they start a computer science degree, you know, they don't really have the math to do it. Mm -hmm. So they take that first class. There's a 40% drop rate yeah. after the first class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that hard. You can get through it, but it's, it's the intimidation factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And so if we can push through that, we already can get a 40% increase in the number of students that continue that program. Yeah. I give you the last word, Christy. Uh, no, I completely agree with what they're saying. And I do believe that we need to, you know, command that we get this type of education for our children, either through these programs that we have coming in through the Venture Center and, and other great organizations, or even through our schools. Uh, we recently gave a grant in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, to a, a charter school there. Um, they already do 3D printing in the third grade, in the third grade, wow. right? So we need to make sure that our children in the state of Arkansas are getting the same opportunities as kids across the nation because we need our children here to come in and compete, excel, and transform Arkansas and the nation. All right, we're going to have to end it there. Our web extra, Lee Watson, Christy Crum, John Burgess, thank you very much. Appreciate all of you and your insights. That is all for this web extra. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can keep up with the latest business and political news each and every day at talkbusiness.net. Thanks for watching.